first of all, uh, we'd like to address the... You the, interview, the interview officially started now? No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, if, if I can ask you a question. Yeah. You recently spoke about IPOs in the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it is expected to have like 190 issues in 2019. Uh, while in Brazil, we have a, a very small market. Uh, we have, if you, if you filter companies by liquidity and uh, corporate adequate corporate governance, we have like a little bit over 200 companies. Mm -hmm. So uh, you've spoken that IPOs are mainly focused, interesting to people uh, playing the price game mm -hmm. uh, rather than the value game. Uh, what do you think in Brazil, since we are an emerging economy, uh with new issues coming to the market we that are focused on the value approach do you think uh could you expand on rather are ipos interesting for people focused on value approach uh rather mm -hmm. than price yeah, what makes price you think approach? what makes you think brazilian investors are focused on the value approach no, not Brazilian investors. Uh, yeah, we, Brazil, we, yeah, Brazil it's a company. pricing game. The Brazilian, if you took a look at the Bovespa over the last ten years, it's a pure pricing game. It's momentum and mood that's driven it. So, it's uh, so the problem. I mean, first, if you think about, it, so if the question is why don't you see more IPOs in a country like Brazil? You have to remember, an IPO is the end of a process. It's not the beginning of a process. I mean, imagine being an entrepreneur in Brazil. You've got a great idea. You want to start a business. What's the first step? You need to find people who are interested in providing you funding. If you don't have an active venture capital market where people are supplying capital to young startups, you will not have IPOs at the other end. So when governments say we want a lot of IPOs, they have to create, I mean, they can't do it. You can't, this can't come from the top down. It's got to come from the bottom up with investors saying, I'm willing to put my money in startups, knowing that for every 10 startups I put money in, maybe two will succeed. And those two will eventually go to the market as public offerings. So if you want more IPOs, the game is to start at the other end. You've got to encourage entrepreneurs. Because if you're a very smart Brazilian entrepreneur with a great idea, you know what you end up doing? You end up moving to Silicon Valley, starting your business there and getting capital from venture capitalists there. And it's not just Brazil. If you're a Norwegian or a Swedish entrepreneur or a German entrepreneur, for whatever reason, the U.S. has a history of venture capital investing, of people who invest in these startups, because it requires a very different mindset to invest in startups, which is most of your startups are going to fail. You're betting on people rather than on businesses, and you have to be given a pathway to succeed. There's another aspect of Brazil that makes it difficult for an entrepreneur to take a business and make it a successful business. The game is stacked against them. you got a system that works against you. It's difficult to work to break into distribution systems. I say only half jokingly that if Elon Musk were had been born in any country other than the United States, yeah, because it, 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 the nature of of people who are disruptors is they're not nice people. And in many countries, these people will never be allowed to succeed because they're viewed as disruptors. They will not be allowed to raise capital. Banks will not lend the money. Investors will not invest in them. You need to be willing to live with people who basically live on the edge. We're not people you would think of as good upstanding citizens. They're, they're people who push the envelope, who take risks, who do things that disrupt the status quo. And in countries like Brazil, those people are not particularly welcome. The establishment will find ways to make it more difficult for them to succeed. So you need two things. One is you need venture capitalists. Two, you need to kind of open up systems so that young startups, companies changing the status quo can come in and do things that are different and succeed. Yes. Uh, we've also noticed that lots of companies in Brazil, they, pr they prefer to... Uh, make their IPOs in the United States rather than mm -hmm. Brazilian markets. We have like uh, Pag uh, Pag Seguro, Stone Payments, uh, XP Inc., which is like a Charles mm -hmm. Schwab from Brazil. Yeah. Uh, do you think that... You know what, that, that, that shouldn't bother you because as long as these businesses stay Brazil-focused, Brazil is getting the benefits of the capital. You should think of this as a good thing. Brazil is an emerging market. Investors in developed markets want to find growth. Guess what? 
your best growth opportunities are often in Brazil and India and China. So I don't have a problem with them making their IPOs as long as they follow up by having a listing in Brazil, allowing Brazilian investors to also partake in the equity. So I think it's true. You want to go where there's more liquidity. And the reality is the US market is the deepest and widest and most liquid market in the world. So if you want uh, Alibaba made its IPO on the NASDAQ, it didn't make it in China. And China is a big liquid market, much more so than Brazil. You get a much more diverse global because you don't get the US investors when you list in the US, you get global investors. So what you're doing as a Brazilian company is you're saying, look, our value as a company is going to be greater if our investor base is global rather than just Brazilian. We're going to go to a market where we're more likely to track global investors. Because if you listen to Bavespa, the reality is I as a U.S. investor will be unable or it's much more difficult for me to invest in a Brazilian startup than if that same startup invests in the U.S. So basically any global investor is interested in partaking in, in Brazil's growth in the future has a better chance of doing it if that company is listed and traded in the US. Eventually, you want the liquidity in Brazil to get rich enough. But for that, the market's got to open up. It's got to allow foreigners to invest. It's got to have fewer restrictions on people who are not Brazilian investing in Brazilian stocks. Make it easier. That process is still messy. If I try to buy a stock on the Bovespa in Sao Paulo, it is incredibly messy for me to kind of go through that process. It's not as simple as getting on Schwab and say, buy a thousand shares of Vale. And it's much easier for me to buy the Vale ADR than it is to buy the Vale. And that's true across the world. It's easier for people to buy the Vale ADR than it is to buy the local listing. So I think that if, if Brazil wants IPOs to eventually list in Brazil, it's got to start opening up its domestic market, reducing the rules and regulations and tax burdens that you impose on in investors investing in that market. And one day you're going to find more IPOs listing in Brazil than in the US. Talking about, so talking about IPOs, one trend we've been seeing either in Brazil or that in the US that there are companies that are not exactly tech companies, but they claim they are tech companies, uh, perhaps for increasing its value. Like, for instance, we have Uber and WeWork. And uh, do you think that uh, that those companies are being uh, very... Uh, They're framing. I mean, very framing. if you're single and you go to a bar and you meet someone you like, you claim to have a great job. Mm -hmm. And you claim to make a large income and you claim to live in a big house. Mm -hmm. It's 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 the nature of the process. They're framing it. And if you fall for the framing, I think it's your fault. I mean, I mean, it, you, Uber can say whatever it wants. But if you take an Uber ride, you know, this is not a tech company. It uses technology to connect you with a car service. So I think if investors want to believe it's a tech company, I blame investors, not the company. The company is doing what it's supposed to do, which it's framing itself so it gets the highest price. It's your job and my job as investors to make sense of is WeWork really a tech company? Is Beyond Meat a really a tech company? Is Uber really a tech company? And none of those three are really tech companies. They use technology to do the businesses they're in, but they're in the car service business, the food business, and the real estate business. What do you think about the, the IPO of WeWork, for instance, that is currently on the trends? Well, this is what happens when you have a business that you've built on what I call a knife edge. The basic problem that WeWork has is a very simple real estate problem. They lease properties for 15. I don't know. They probably are in Sao Paulo, right? I mean, they probably there's a WeWork yeah. building. Really. We are currently on the WeWork. Right yeah. this building is a we, the building you're in is a WeWork building? Okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. find out what the contract is. My, my sense is they probably lease the building for 15, 20 years. And then they rent out offices to people like you for days, weeks, or months. So basically, the mismatch is their commitment runs 15 years, but the, the, the customers they get are contracting for one month, three months, six months, often small startups, which are trying to take advantage of the fact that you can rent space in the short term. You think, what's wrong with that? All you need is, an econo is a recession. Because what happens in a recession is young startups stop starting and then all of a sudden your customers all leave. You're still stuck with the contract. So WeWork is a company that is growing incredibly fast by taking all these lease commitments. So there's a huge, huge, huge lease commitment debt, which means that 
for it to succeed, it's got to keep growing. It, this is like a Ponzi scheme. You've got to keep growing, having more customers, having more leases, because if the process slows down, then the pain catches up with you. So, and the problem is we work in a, in a six week period has gone from being viewed as this successful real estate business to some the company that no, I mean, my guess is the people who lease re, we work, the, the building you're sitting in are probably really worried right now about whether we work will make its commitments. And if they could get out of the contract, they'd probably get out of the contract. And this is happening around the world is in in real estate deal after real estate deal where we work was the lessor the or the lessee the lessors are saying no no i don't want we work as my as as my because i don't know whether they'll be around so it's very quickly unraveled and part of the reason is they tried to grow too fast and took on too many commitments and now they're all catching up with them well uh Referring to IPOs happening in Brazil, this year we had a new issuance from a, a jewelry retailer called Vivara. Uh -huh. And uh, this company, it, it was valued by the, the common metrics like PE, if EV to EBITDA, and uh, market cap to revenue uh, on a more expensive basis than like Tiffany's, which is a global peer. Uh, yeah, see, that, that doesn't bother me. I'll tell you why. I think these metrics will fail. I mean, use any of those metrics for Uber. Uber will look incredibly expensive, right? But yes. if, you, if you read my blog post la, end of last week, I bought Uber at 30. Yes, I read it. And, it, so, and Uber at 30 will look more expensive than pretty much any transportation company in any multiple that you pay. But you know why these metrics fell down? These metrics were invented for mature firms. So the bulk of the value is already on the ground. Your earnings are already being coming from them. You could have growth, but growth is on is the side game. It's not the main game. When you invest in Uber or a Pinterest or a Slack, the bulk of your value is in the future. What you're paying in the market is for not the earnings on existing businesses, but what you expect them to do in the future. So on those metrics, these companies will always look expensive. So that's why old time value investors have, did not buy Facebook, they didn't buy Google, they didn't buy any of the companies that are today the companies that create the market cap of the S&P 500. I mean, think about it. Warren Buffett has never owned Microsoft. He never owned Apple. He never owned Amazon. And he's and as a consequence, over the last 20 years, he's had a tough time keeping up the S&P 500. There's a price you pay when you use old time metrics and you stick with them is you'll end up with a lot of mature companies in your portfolio and you will never buy those young growth companies that become the superstars of the future. But you have to remember that investing in these young superstar companies is a different kind of investment strategy. You can't buy just four companies and hope that they all do. You have to buy 15 or 20 or 25. And you've got to spread your bets because you're not expecting every one of your young companies to become a winner. You just want the winners in your portfolio to do so well. You know, remember, there's this talk of 10 baggers. So if you're an investor, you want a 10 bagger, a stock that goes up 10 fold. These are the stocks that will go up 10 fold. Now, I'd rather take my bets on Uber at 30 than Kraft Heinz at 22. Now, the upside there is that if Uber can find a way to take its now, 100 million riders and convert them into pure gold. I, you know, my $30 can become 250 and that will never happen with the craft touch. But, but is, is it a little bit difficult to pay for future uh, earnings? This, like well, you, always, you always pay for future earnings, even for craft well, times, Without right? like a com clear competitive advantages like Vivara in Brazil, Uber had, has more than competitive advantages. Professor, yeah. would you mind uh, to tell us if you still have uh, Vale, Petrobras, Embraer, and Ambev in your portfolio? I mean, I read that some time ago you had um, those. I companies. sold Vale, and, and I wrote a blog post when I sold it in 2015 because I screwed up when I bought Vale in 2013. I bought it back about six months later. At um, you know, I'm trying to think. I, I bought. I have it in dollar terms in my head. And it's gone up. I mean, I, since I bought it, it's up 500 percent. It's still in my portfolio because it's one of my commodity players. It's it's a bet on commodities. I think it's now fully priced. I am not holding it because it's some cheap stock, but it's as good an investment in the commodity side of the business as any other commodity company. Petrobras, I 
you know, I, it's a stock that frustrates me because I mean, I, I bought it again after. I mean, I bought it after the collapse. After and the again, collapse. Done reasonably well, but it's very much of an oil play now. Again, it's fully priced. Empire is a long-term player in my portfolio. I don't. I've owned it for twenty years. I don't think of it as a stock that's going. I mean, I bought it. I mean, I'll tell you how old, how long it's been in my portfolio. I bought it when Lula was running for president and people were so terrified he would win and they were knocking down the prices of every Brazilian company, including Embraer. And I said, that doesn't make sense. Here's a stock that makes 97% of its revenues outside Brazil. And you're treating it like you would Embevage. At that time, was just a Brazilian beverage company. So I bought Embraer a long, long, long time ago in my portfolio. It's still there. So those are my three Brazilian beds. I haven't freshened it because, to be quite honest, no small young Brazilian. I mean, I came close to buying, you know, a, a couple of Brazilian companies, you know, but I, I, there, there hasn't been anything else that's caught my eye. But that's because I don't stay abreast with the Brazilian market as much as most Brazilian investors do. Because I'm in India. I mean, especially in the last year, I haven't been to Latin America. And usually, when I, you know, when I go to Latin America is when I take a closer look at those markets. So I've added Indonesian stocks to my portfolio, I have Indian stocks, I have Czechoslovakian stocks, Polish stock, because every time I travel to a country, I find something interesting there. So I'm expecting to come back to Latin America next August, and I'll be in Sao Paulo then. So that'll give me a chance to take another look at the market. Especially, I'm interested in finding a small growth Brazilian company at a reasonable price. And that's going to be my next add to my portfolio is I don't want another big Brazilian player because I've got three of them already. And uh, I want something which will give me a chance to take advantage of the growth that will happen in Brazil. And it's a bet on Brazil's future, but I, I would like a smaller growth company. Yeah, your uh, corp uh, corporate finance course, you explained the case of Disney with uh, Eisner, mm -hmm. where it had like a misalignment of interests with the shareholders and uh well that's a, a case where the, the the governance was not uh, proper for shareholders but we also have cases like mark mark zuckerberg on facebook where like one key person is perhaps uh the cause of a lot of value being created to shareholders uh how much attention do you pay to corporate governance before uh, investing in a company and uh, if you could just uh, expand on the importance of it and uh well i worry but i'll tell you why i mean i worry about a system that locks in existing management forever I, and i use the language of of democracy to explain why sometimes you can have dictators who are benevolent dictators right you like the dictator because he's brought law and order back he's making the kind of the trains run on time you know you can think of chile and uh, when um, in the early 70s, you know, this is this is, you know, you're getting the country back in order. Mm -hmm. The only problem is benevolent dictators can sometimes become malevolent dictators in a democracy. Here's the advantage you get every four or five, uh, whatever the number of years is in Brazil. You get a chance to oh, replace man, uh, replace the government if you feel it's not. I mean, it's a chance you might not take. You might choose not to vote. You might vote for the wrong. But you get that chance every five years. And if you have a good government, they might get reelected over and over again. And that's na the nature of democracy. In a dictatorship, I am essentially trusting Zuckerberg not only to be a good CEO now, but a good CEO forever. And that's scary. And that scares me. How much would I discount the value of Facebook for it? It depends on how, you know, how much he throws his weight around. And to be honest, I like the way Zuckerberg has worked with Facebook. He's not taken things. He's not done things for, per I mean, you don't see him doing things because personally he feels it, it, it for an ego boost, right? There are some CEOs who say, I'm going to do this acquisition because it makes me feel better. Zuckerberg has been closer to Bill Gates in the way he's managed Facebook than he has been to some of those dictatorial CEOs at other companies who start doing things just because they're impulsive. You know? So I've been impressed with the way he's managed the company. The privacy issues have been there no matter who ran the company, because this is a company built on invading your privacy. It's kind of hypocritical to point to Facebook saying, how come you're taking what you've learned about me and using it on me? Well, guess what? Who gave them the information to use on you? It's you. So when people get hypocritical, say, how come you're doing this? Well, stop posting everything in your personal life on Facebook and Facebook will start finding out less about you. So 
my concern with Facebook is less than my concern would have been with WeWork if Adam Newman branded. Because Adam Newman was also a dictator, but he seemed to be doing things. He did things like, I don't know if you, I don't know whether you read the story about he came back from a flight in Europe and for whatever reason, he got a bee in his bonnet about meat and he banned all meat being eaten in the WeWork offices. So everybody had to be either vegetarian or vegan. No. And this is the kind of impulsive thing that dictators do. I mean, you, it's not something a CEO of a business should be doing. So I think that when you get impulsive, and that's one reason I'm more concerned with Tesla than I would be with Amazon. Jeff Bezos rules Amazon. Elon Musk rules Tesla. But Elon Musk does some really crazy things as a CEO that are personal things, like that Thai, you know, cave where people got trapped, and he sent a, you know, sent a boring machine to put a hole in there. That's the kind of thing that drives me crazy. I want Tesla. Now, again, I bought it at 180, and again, I told people, look, I view it as a, as my corporate teenager. I mean, if any of you, have, if you have, remember when you were a teenager, what teenagers do is every morning they wake up and they ask a question, which is, I have lots of potential, but what can I do to screw it up today? They do things that are really stupid, and Tesla strikes me as a corporate teenager. So it worried me. For a long, re for a long time, I think it held Tesla's value down. So when I valued Tesla, I had to bring in Elon Musk on predictability. He is po he, you can't remove him. He, he is Tesla. He is the visionary who built Tesla. So I think he's done a lot of good things. But he also is, has all his weaknesses as a human being play out as a corporate CEO. So I think it depends. I mean, some corporate CEOs are worried less. I, I, I would say corporate governance is more than just about the CEO, right? I mean, it depends on where the power lies. I mean, if you read my post, I wrote it about four years ago, five years ago, at the very bottom of Petrobras, where I took a, took apart why, how Petrobras went from being a $200 billion company to a $10 billion company. Exact opposite of what it's supposed to do. One of the things I pointed to was that its corporate governance was driven by who managers thought they had to keep happy. And what managers at Petrobras realized was they didn't have to keep stockholders happy. They had to keep people in Brasilia happy to hold on to their jobs. So guess what? They delivered whatever the people in Brasilia wanted, which was go, go, go for more oil, become the biggest oil company in the world, even if it didn't make sense. So corporate governance is more about you know, entrenching CEOs and more and, and less about entrenching CEOs, more about who do CEOs want to keep happy. And at Facebook, at least, my sense is Zuckerberg really cares about the stock price, whether it's for personal or selfish reasons or for the, the public good. It doesn't really matter to me because if he cares about the stock price, I'm going to benefit. So as a Facebook stockholder, I, I'm glad he's focused on increasing the stock price. But if he loses that focus, then I worry. We in Brazil right now, we are going through a, a tenuous political moment with a, a pension reform where like our social security system is not uh, so sustainable in the long term. Uh, and uh, it, it's perhaps causing outflows from, uh, from foreign investors or maybe uh, repelling from money coming in. Do you think it, it, it's a true statement? Uh, well, let's go all the way back to 2013. Every year, you have a different reason for me to hold up, hold back from investing in Brazil, right? In 2015, mm -hmm. 2015, the car wash, then the 2016, then another election. Let's wait for the election. You know what? You can't wait. Brazil is an emerging market. You're going, and it's a democracy, which also means that you don't get predictability. You're going to get. So if this passes, you think there won't be something else next year that comes up. For people who want. To wait for complete stability in Brazil, you're going to be waiting a really long time. I mean, I invest in India too. India has its issues now. It's got political issues. It's got economic issues. If now, You're right. Brazil does have a long-term social security problem. And it's been 30 years in the making, right? Because government after government has allowed this to continue because there are a lot of voters who get that, that social security. And if you cut it, you're going to lose a lot of votes. So... This is not a problem that started last year. It's a problem that's been decades in, in the process of building. And it's always going to be painful. It's like ripping off um, a scab, right? You can rip it or a band-aid. You know, rip it off slowly. You can rip it off fast. Whatever, my only advice is do whatever you're doing. Do it fast. Get it over with. I mean, it's just um, 
the longer you let this continue, the less the less good comes out of it. So, uh, I, but to me, it's it's not going to stop me from investing in Brazil because the reality is, when this passes, there'll be something else, and then something else, and the next election is going to be here, and then something else, and then something else. This is this is emerging market for you. One more question: If we still have time, yeah. Uh, We've been seeing a, a global trend of falling interest rates, uh, sometimes negative re interest rates. Even in Brazil, we have this trend right now. Uh, it's, it's expected to we reach the zero, uh, close to zero the next in the next year. Uh, what investors uh, could expect about the influence of this, those falling interest rates around the world or even Brazilian market? Let it go. I mean, it's not uh, the equities. Uh, uh, on the equity market. As investors, I, I, I take the karmic view of these things. There are things I control and things I don't. Interest rates is one of those things. I've got to live in the world I'm in. And you know what? These are an interest rates that started falling last year. They've been low for 11 years. So when people say this, you know, they're going to bounce back. Bounce back to what? So when I value companies, I take interest rates as what they are. I was in Europe last month and I valued Heineken in euros. My risk-free rate was negative. Doesn't bother me in the least. Negative risk-free rates are also signals that other things are happening, right? You have deflation, you have deflation, you have low growth. So the same things that keep your interest rates low are also keeping growth low. They keep, I mean, they're keeping risk premiums high. There's a whole host of things that go with low risk-free rates. So when people say, well, when risk-free rates go up, when stock prices drop, depends, right? Because risk-free rates go up for the right reasons. If people start to get more optimistic about the economy. Well, guess what? Growth goes up, your cash flows grow up. So it's very difficult to hold everything else constant and just focus on risk free on interest rates. So I tell people, look, interest rates are what they are. You don't control them. Don't spend your days worrying about what interest rates will do. Just value the company in front of you. Decide whether to buy or sell the company and then move on. Because otherwise you're going to drive yourself crazy. <laughs> If we look to the equity premium risk nowadays, yeah. uh, stocks are uh, are not overvalued. They are like compared to the relative uh, T bonds. The, but always add the conditional statement. Given the cash flows that they're creating right now, they don't look overvalued. So when people say there's a bubble, they've got to make a stronger case. And the only way that you can make a case that stocks are in a bubble is you got to show me a scenario where earnings collapse, which could happen, and then companies pull back on cash flows, which in the US is stopping buybacks. And if that happens, stocks would very quickly go from being okay to being overvalued. But people who make, who make arguments for bubbles need to do their homework. They can't be lazy and tell me, oh, there's a bubble because stocks have been going up for a long time, which seems to be the essence of some argument. Or the PE ratio is high. So what? The interest rates are low. So you can't just make that argument. You've got to make a stronger argument about economic growth collapsing. And right now, people say, oh, global growth is getting lower. Okay, now you've got to make the link. If that happens, show me that earnings will drop. And if earnings drop, show me that cash flows will drop. And if you can make all those links, then we can talk about stocks being overvalued. Yeah, good because it's a, a misconception in Brazil. They just look at like the S and P five hundred more than tripling in the last yeah. ten years. The earnings and cash flows are also tripled. Exactly, the fundamentals yeah, like a, you know, they were up too. So. <laughs> it's a relative statement, right? So that's why you can't just yeah. look at the graph of stock price. They look, they're up three hundred percent. Therefore, stocks must be over overpriced. Well, not necessarily. If earnings went up three hundred percent and cash flows went up three hundred percent. Everything's very, you know scared up. How can they be overpriced? Yeah, and if you get like the earnings yield, like the inverse of yeah. PE, and compared to yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I think people make lazy arguments, and some of these people have Nobel prizes. So just because somebody has a Nobel prize doesn't mean that they can't be lazy. Also, in Brazil, we have a history of high interest rates, so we have a lot of the population that are uh, used to just mm -hmm. live through fixed income. And, and now, you know, you know what? Inflation is deadly for equity. If inflation in the U.S. went to double digits, equities would die. It's just the nature of the game, right? Because when you have high inflation, what's your first priority as an investor? What do you have to do? You have to protect yourself against inflation. Right? Everything else becomes secondary. Because if you have 30% inflation and you don't protect yourself, you can get ruined in no time at all. 
So as inflation rises, you are going to get people going to fix deposits, money that's guaranteed. So it's not their fault. I don't blame them. That's exactly what I would do too with 50% inflation. I'm not investing in equities. But but do you think like the, the, this tendency of low interest rates that, that it may propel people to invest more in equities? Not inflation. The interest rates are, don't let it distract you. It's inflation worries that will always drive investors. If interest rates are low, but they're somehow kept, you know, they, they, they're much lower than inflation, you've still lost the game, mm -hmm. right? That's yeah, true. Because they will then go to other assets that will protect them against inflation. It might be real estate, it might be gold in, in, in India. That's a standard fallback. So I th think you can't artificially force people into investing in equities by keeping interest rates low. You have to kind of keep bring inflation under control. So what I would hope is happening in Brazil that's bringing interest rates low is that the forces that drive inflation are being brought under. I'm not sure that's happening, but if that's not happening, then you could have the worst of both worlds, right? You could have inflation still driving decisions and low interest rates, meaning people are not saving money in banks or in financial assets. They're putting it to real assets. Yeah. Well, Professor, is there something else we didn't ask that we would like to point out or something? Uh, for yeah, I, I think you started, the, I think you started the, 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 the session by pointing out that very few Brazilians invest in the equity market. True. And in that you need, there are two things that you have to remember. One is to invest, you need savings. To have savings, your income has to exceed your expenses. I mean, starting saving the obvious. 80% of Brazilians probably don't even have the option of investing because they live day to day, week to week, month to month. I'd say the same thing about Indians, 80%. The question is the remaining 50 to 20% is still a pretty substantial number. Why are more of them investing in equities? For a couple of reasons. One is um, they think the game is fixed, a lot of them. They believe that equity markets are run by insiders who basically have information they get and they don't share with the market. And guess what? In Brazil, it's not a bad assumption if you're an outside investor that the game is not a fair game, that there are some insiders who have access. I mean, that's why it's, I think I'm not a great fan of government regulation and laws, but I think it's good to have insider trading laws that are enforced because it makes the game fair. It makes people more willing to play the game. The second is, you need to develop an equity culture and that takes a long time. You know what an equity culture means? It basically means that when you invest money, you got to be willing to lose money. If you're trained to believe that your principle is always going to be safe, that if you invest $100, you will get at least $100 back. And the only thing you're uncertain about is whether you make 2% or 15%, you can never invest in equities. You got to be okay opening up your brokerage account and seeing that your portfolio is down 10%. And that's easier said than done. When people, when you talk about this with people, they say, I'm okay with that. But that first statement that they get scares them so much that they don't want to do it again. And equity culture means people who take risks have to recognize that they will lose money sometimes. And they will lose a lot of money sometimes. And they should be okay with it. Last week when I bought Uber and I sold short and Beyond Meat, I said, look, I might lose a lot of money on these. And you will point it out to me if I do lose money, the people are reading my blog post. But you know what? I'm okay with losing money. The nature of risk is sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. You want to win more than you lose. And you want your overall portfolio to go up. But if you say, look, I don't want to ever lose money, you can never invest in equities. And that requires people to go through an equity cycle where they invest in equities, lose money, stay in equities, and see that it comes back for that culture to get embedded. In the US, that culture has been around since before the Great Depression. In fact, after the Great Depression, people even in the US started to pull away from the equity culture. But it's a deeply embedded culture because it's been around. People know that their equity part of the portfolio can drop. And they know that if they're in for the long term, odds are it'll come back up again. But that takes a long time. And you know what else it requires? You have to have governments that don't step in and protect you from your own mistakes. 
you know, it's a, and it's, it's a problem in the Middle East. People, you know, when I talked to Saudi Arabia, somebody in the Saudi Arabian government, they said, we have to train, we, have, we want an equity culture in Saudi Arabia. And I said, if you want an equity culture in Saudi Arabia, stop bailing out investors every time the equity market drops. Because when the equity market drops, the Saudi government actually steps in and provides price support so that investors don't lose more money. That's not a way to do an equity culture. You got to let people live. It's, it sounds cruel, but even middle class investors, if they take their money and put it in one stock and they lose it all, you got to say, you know what? That was terrible. I feel, you know, I feel awful. And you might feel awful, but you can't step in and say, well, we're going to give you 50% of your money back because this was your entire savings. You got to let people live with the consequence of their mistakes, which means you can't act like a, like a parrot. These are not kids. They're grown-ups making investment decisions. Let them live with the consequences. Uh, I think that there's a, a notion in Brazil. People look to stocks like they were lottery tickets, and uh, then the, it, it makes them less susceptible to uh, go through you this. Know what? That's fine. There are people in the U.S. who think of stocks as lottery tickets as well. You know how they learn their lesson is when they don't make the big lottery winnings. You know. You live and learn, though. There will always be a subset of investors who think stocks are gambling and gam I mean, a day trader. He's not investing. He's gambling. He's gambling on pricing momentum. Am I going to stop them? No, because they're the liquidity that allows me as a value investor to be able to buy Uber. You need people who think they can make a lot of money quickly to be in the market to provide liquidity. And I don't. So I, I view them as doing a service for me. So don't try to talk them off the ledge. Let them do what they're doing because you're not going to be able to change their minds. They might, they're convinced that they can quadruple their money in 15 minutes. Let them do it. They're exactly, if every investor were a long time value investor, markets would die. There'd be no liquidity. There'd be no trading. You need people, which tells you what, that most people in markets are not investors. They play the pricing game. They're trading. Yeah, and it's our, our not our duty, but uh, it's what makes it possible for us to buy undervalued equities. Exactly. Yeah, sure. Exactly. Yeah, sure. In Brazil, uh, we don't have dividend taxes. Uh, we have like 34%, 34% corporate taxes. Mm -hmm. And when we look to most developed countries, they tax dividends. Uh, and what about capital gains? After the, the tax act in the United States, like it, it's the corporate no, tax. So what about capital gains? Forget about the corporate tax. The corporate tax is all over the world. So okay. capital gains is fifteen percent. It's fifteen percent in Brazil. Fifteen percent. Yeah. Yes. It's but a, do you think? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Do you think uh, having higher corporate taxes and not taxing dividends, uh, like, uh, is not an incentive to reinvestment? For, for the, I don't the think that's the issue. I think it's just an extension of what you said earlier, which is well, how do Brazilians invest? They invest for income, right? Because that's how you cover inflation. They want to fix it. So you go to a bank, you get a 15% interest rate. They're used to collecting the income. So I think the government is operating under this misguided view that if they make stocks look like fixed deposits, that people will like stocks, which is a terrible way to think about equities. You know who's hurting? It's hurting young growth companies. You ask me how come there are not more IPOs in Brazil? If people expect you to pay a big dividend, that's why they buy stocks. Why would I ever, as a young growth company, list myself in Brazil? What Brazilian investor is going to buy my stock if I told them, look, you know, I've got negative cash flows for the next 10 years. Not only will I not be paying you a dividend, but I'll keep issuing shares. The typical Brazilian investor who's trained to collect cash flows and dividends every year is going to say, you're a terrible company, go away, which means Facebook, Google, Amazon, Apple would never have made it to becoming who they are today. So I think this is a reflection. Inflation leads deep wounds. I mean, hyperinflation in Brazil was, what, 1991, 92? You know what? You're still recovering from it. You might think you're over it, but it's still the system is structured around dealing with inflation and getting investors okay with it. So I think that's what you see here. History, your history kind of affects almost everything that you see. 
Yeah, it's like a culture embedded in our, in our population and they have to play the, the game. It's not a cultural thing. It's an inflation thing. If you had hyperinflation in the U.S., you would have exactly the same kind of thing happening in the U.S. So don't blame Brazilians for what they're doing. Blame what happened in your economic history for why Brazilians are where they, what they are. Because it's so easy to say, well, culturally, we're not long term. We're all short. Sure, we're all impatient. I don't like that. I think it, it, investors all over the world have a distribution. There are long term investors in Brazil and there are short term traders in Brazil. There are long term investors in the US and short term traders in the US. So I think it's not a cultural thing. It, you are a product of your history. And Brazil has an economic history that has left a lot of deep wounds on investors. So I never blame investors for what they do. I look at the history and say, I understand why you're doing what you're doing, but it's hurting you now because of that. So I think you got to cut some slack for Brazilian investors. It's such a great point of view. It opens my mind. Uh, I thank you so much, uh, 